think it's after my father died uh, that I decided to write um, for revenge. I wanted a, a revenge against all people that were bad to us, against the injustice. I wanted to show them what I had inside me. So, yeah, I think that it began like that. It was something violent and something that came from a desire of, um, of revenge. Oh, so I was born in Morocco in 1981. I have two sisters. My mother was a doctor and my father was a banker. I had a very ordinary childhood, very normal. My parents were very free people, very nice. But um, they, yeah, I think that um, they were a little bit harsh when it came to studying because we were three girls and for them it was very important that we study a lot and that we work very well and that we go, go to France to do very good um, just studying. So my two sisters are doctor and then I went to France when I was 18 to study literature and, and philosophy and then uh, political science. Having two cultures didn't give me like a bigger horizon. It was, as I said, very confused because I didn't no, at the time, was if I was French, if I was Moroccan, if I was anything, my parents would never talk about that. They didn't give us any sense of nationalism or patriotism or identity. It was not very important for us. We had our values, we had our vision of the world, um, the sense of being a human being um, who must respect any other human being. And the rest was not really clear for me. So when I arrived in France, I didn't know at that time that I was from Morocco and that people were going to look at me as a, as a Moroccan. So that's something that didn't really exist when I was a child. The fact that I speak French with my parents uh, was something kind of weird in a way because we were living in Morocco and my parents are Moroccan and we were speaking French uh, and it took me some years to understand why we were speaking French because my parents were children when the Morocco were colonized so they went to colonial school and they learned French and then they studied in France and also because I belong to a uh, upper class to bourgeoisie class so I think that maybe the only identity I was conscious of when I was a child and when I was a teenager is the identity of being a bourgeois. And uh, for me, I think it's even more important than being French or Moroccan because what makes the difference in life is the social class. Um, being poor, being uh, from the labor class, being dominated, being humiliated is much more linked, I think, to your social class than to your culture. When you are a bourgeois, that's exactly the education you receive. The idea that the world is your place and you can go anywhere and you can integrate anywhere and that everything is easy. So sometimes I think it's too easy to speak about just identity and to speak about your passport and your the color of your skin and this and that. I think that the most important is where do you belong socially? The relationship to books in my family was very strong, even though my parents, they never forced us to, to read. My younger sister, she, hate, she hated to reading when she was a child. Now she, she loves, but my parents never forced her. They, they said she's going to read at one point, when she decided to, when she wants to. Uh, so my parents were really fond of literature, but also of cinema very much, a um, little bit of music. And I was the one who read the, the most. And my father, who had always a lot of books around him, he was always sitting in the same place in the, in the house. And he had a lot of books. And at the end, it was like a wall. Um, and my father was someone who was, was very silent. It was not very easy to communicate with him. So I understood very young that if I wanted to communicate with him, I had to take a book. And if I take a book, then I read the book and then I can come and tell him what I thought of the book. And then he would pay attention to me. But um, I think it was for me a way to build a bridge with my father and to maybe to seduce him. When I was a child and I was reading, I think that um, sometimes I was at the 
really at the frontier of craziness uh, because I was feeling that I was living in the book. Um, I was very bored uh, at home and I thought that our life was not very interesting, but life in books was very interesting. So uh, I was telling myself that I was one of the characters of the book. And I remember that I was reading a lot of Russian novels and when I was a teenager and um, I became absolutely convinced that I was a Rus Russian myself. And I told my parents that I was Russian. And so I decided to wear Russian clothes and I was living in Morocco, it's quite hot in the summer, but I wanted to have a big coat and a shapka and I began to eat Russian food and I was absolutely convinced that I was living in this universe in Tolstoy or Dostoevsky's book. So yeah, I was pretty, um, pretty convinced that every book is a universe, but even that I can go in this universe, that I can jump into it and live in it. I immediately felt something really strong with Russian uh, novelists. I think that one of the first books I read was a book of Dostoevsky called in French, Humilié et Offensé, so I suppose it's humiliated and offended, I think. And it's a book about poverty, and it's a book about a man who is really poor and a little girl. and. I felt like he was describing the world I was living in. Uh, even though he was writing one century uh, ago in a very different country from mine, he was speaking about humiliation, he was speaking about deep poverty, he was speaking about a blindness of the, the bourgeois, the fact that they are so indifferent to poor people. And I was really, really um, overwhelmed by, th by this book. And also, I think that what I love with Russian novels and that maybe um, has to do something with my personality is that much more than French novel or British novel, the Russian novel is really about metaphysique. They ask questions, the biggest question, does God exist? Why does evil exist? Um, is it possible to be faithful to ourselves or to other people? And so I think that I come also from Morocco, from a culture that has a very strong spirituality that is very deep. So maybe that's why I was so seduced by the, um, the Russian literature, but it was very important for me. So what I understood with literature, the, the for the first big and wonderful novels that I, that I read, um, I was reading a book, for instance, written in the United States a uh, hundred years ago, and I was feeling exactly the same thing as the character or the character or the writer was able to express something that I knew or that I have experienced and that I was absolutely unable to express. Or it was expressing something that I've never experienced, that I don't know at all, but I can understand it, even though I have no experience of that. And so I understood that what my parents were telling me about universality, not only universality of the of our the fact that we are human beings, but universality of emotions. The fact that, yes, the world changed. We don't dress all the same. We don't eat the same things. We don't believe in the same gods. And we have different values, different way of life. But the way we love and the way we are afraid, the fact that we are going to die, the fact that we are anxious for our children, the fact that we fight and that we provoke wars and that sometimes we are heroes, all this can be understood by any human being, and that's something wonderful. Yeah, Simone de Beauvoir changed my life. The first time I heard about her, I, I found a, a photograph of her. She's uh, sitting in the Café de Flore uh, in front of a table full of books, and she's like this. She's writing something. She's really beautiful. She looks very serious, very grave, very... And um, I asked my mother, who is this woman? And my mother said, she's, she's an intellectual. She's a very free woman. She's very famous in France, and she's a feminist. I said, what is a feminist? What is an intellectual? What is this? And so she told me, and I was like, I want exactly the same life. This woman has the most wonderful life that a woman can have. She's free, she's thinking, she's writing, she's traveling. She, she has all I want to have. And then when I went to France for the first time, 
the first day I arrived, I went to Café de Flore to see the place where Simone de Beauvoir wrote and, and lived. And I sat on the terrace and it was the first time in my life that I was sitting on the terrace alone. And I told myself, if you can stay on this terrace for the whole afternoon, alone, drinking a glass of wine without taking care of anything around you, you're going to make something with your life. And I stayed the, the whole afternoon. And then I went to the library and I asked for Le Deuxième Sex. But at that time, I thought it was an erotic book. And so I was a little bit ashamed to ask about the book. And when I began to read, I discovered that it was not that at all. And um, I was a little bit disappointed at the beginning. But then I read and I read and I read. And it was something extraordinary because I felt that the more I was reading, the more I was gaining knowledge and the more emancipated I was. And I understood that there is no emancipation without knowledge. There is no emancipation without books. That it is impossible to be a free woman if you don't deconstruct everything that people told you. And if you don't try to dig to understand exactly where all this comes from, where this domination comes from, that you need to have arguments. You need to be strong in terms of intellectually to answer the people who will try all the time to dominate you. I didn't decide to go to Paris. It was not my decision. And uh, it was something that uh, everyone was doing. You were 18 and you would go abroad to study. It was like that. So when I was 12, I knew that when I was going to turn 18, I was going to leave home. So I never questioned that. Uh, so I knew that I was going to leave my parents and that I will have to take care of myself and study and be very serious. Uh, my parents were liberal, for sure, compared to other parents. But at the same time, as you said, I was living in Morocco and uh, I was living in a country and at a time also where a um, lot of people were very patriarchal and very misogynist, uh, even though, um, yeah, even though they pretended to be open-minded and uh, more influenced by, by the West. So my father, he was very, he was nice. He was not, um, he was not violent or um, he was not trying to dominate us. But at the same time, he would never do something at home. My father never helped my mother in anything. He was always seated waiting for people to serve him and to give him what he needed. He would, would always uh, make uh, comments on the way we were, um, what we, how, how we were looking and the dress. Is this dress okay? Even on the way my mother would dress. So um, yes, it was liberal in a way, but in another way, uh, I was not imagining at all having the life of Simone de Beauvoir in my country. Um, my own aunt, she was smoking. She was 60 years old. She was smoking and she never smoked in, in, inside, uh, in front of my father or in front of her father it, or her brother. It was absolutely impossible. The idea of a woman smoking was like you're a prostitute. If you, if you smoke, if you speak out, if you say exactly what you think, if you drink too much, if you have the sexual life you want to have. So a lot of things were forbidden. I dedicated my first novel to my parents because they made it possible for me to to be me and they gave me a beautiful gift. They never told me who I was. They never defined me. They always told me, you're free, you're going to invent yourself. We can't help you, we can't tell you uh, who you are. And I think at the beginning it was a little bit frightening. But then I have to say that, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful gift that uh, your parents, they, they don't lock you in an identity, they don't put you in a box, they give you the opportunity to to become who you are. And I think also um, I dedicated the book to them because my father died. And I think that even if it can seem very cruel to say that, um, in a way it's a gift that he gave me, the fact that he died. It made a lot of things possible that would have been impossible if he was alive. So I arrived in Paris when I was 18. I don't really remember, it's not really clear in my head, but uh, it was freedom. It was, um, it was freedom and at the same time it was loneliness. It was difficult. The first year was, were really difficult because the city was so big. Um, it was cold. I was lonely. 
I understood nothing. I didn't understand how the, the city was working. Uh, I came from a country and from a family where a lot of people would take care of me. I knew nothing. I was a baby. I was very dependent on my parents, on, on the people who would take care of me. So it took me a lot of time to become more independent. And also, I think it's difficult to make friends in a city like Paris especially in the center of Paris where I was studying. People, they know each other, they have their, their codes, their rituals, and um, it's difficult to get in this, um, yeah, the, this group that, uh, that is very, um, very cold and very distant to, to strangers, I think. Um, there is two, there is two face to this situation. I have to say, as I said before, that um, I was not an immigrant who arrived in because of a war, because of starving, because of a crisis. Uh, I didn't have to take a boat and uh, uh, almost died uh, dr drowning on the on the sea. I came with a visa, I came with a plane, and I had an apartment, and I was studying in one of the best schools of, of France. I would speak perfect French. I knew everything about French history. It was not difficult in that sense. And uh, people would not make difference between me and some someone else. And they were, in, in a way, very proud and very happy that I, wow, you come from Morocco and you know so much and you understand the way we live here. So there was that. But of course, there there is racism, different kind of racism. People in the street who don't know who you are, just they judge you just on the color of your skin, on your hair. And that's very interesting because that's also at that moment that I understood that racism is something really physical. Uh, people think that it's an abstraction, that it's theoretical, that it's a concept. It's not a concept. It's like being slapped on the face. It's like uh, it's something that you feel physically. When someone is racist against you, you the, the reaction you have is not theoretical. It's not an abstraction. It's something that you feel in your skin, that you feel in your in your guts, uh, you feel that there is a problem with the way you look. You feel that there is a problem with your hair, with your skin, and this is something that you can't change. So it makes you feel very, um, very angry, very frustrated. So yeah, I had this kind of experience of racism. And there is the other experience that is more a sort of despise. You know, they don't really... They, they seem to be very um, happy that uh, you are uh, so much integrated in their country and they, yeah, they, they express a certain joy to see you understand France and they have the feeling that they are freeing you. And also the other thing is that I came from, as I said, a bourgeois background and sometimes French people, they think that it's okay in front of me to say very bad things on Moroccan people or people who wear veil or people who don't speak good French. And they think that I'm going to be sort of accomplice with them and that I will laugh to their jokes. And they don't understand that uh, they are uh, hurting me. Um, so racism has different faces and different way to be expressed. And being an immigrant also is something complex. All immigrants are not the same. But of course, sometimes we have common experiences. After 9-11, we became Muslim. And I think it's not only in Europe, but even in our countries, even in Morocco, uh, Islamism and uh, conser conservatives were more and more powerful, more and more visible. There was uh, an attack also in Morocco in 2003 in Casablanca. A lot of people were killed. So the world completely changed at that time. The Muslim identity, the fact that Western people look at you as Muslim, but Islamists also look at you at, as Muslim and tell you you're not a good Muslim and you're going maybe to die for that and they threaten you. So we felt, I think, people like me, who are not very religious, who um, believe in um, individual freedom, we were in a way completely trapped because uh, we were put in that box in the 
the eyes of Western people and in the eyes of Islamists. And so we were Muslim, Muslim, Muslim all the time. Although we are not, we don't define ourselves like Muslim. So it was really difficult. I've always known, to be honest, that I was going to be a writer. When I was very young, when I was like six or seven, I remember that we were having dinner and we had friends. And um, the friend of my mother asked, and Leila, what do you want to do? And my mother looked at the friend and she said, but Leila is going to be a writer. And for her, it was absolutely sure. She never had any doubts. And um, I remember that when I was studying and sometimes I was anxious because of my exams or things like that, my mother, she would always say, well, why, why are you anxious? You're going to be a writer, you know it, I know it. And so, yeah, for, for them, for my parents, it was written. It was my destiny. So I don't know if they convinced me of, of that or if myself, I wanted that, but it's what happened. I don't know why I write this book or another book or why I write this story. It's impossible to answer this question. And people who would answer this question, they would lie. Because I think that we never know. We never know um, what makes us so obsessed or so passionate about a story. And I think that it's good like that. If uh, we try too much to analyze and to understand the cause and why all this, we lose the magic, we lose the mystery. What is wonderful when you write is that you don't know why you write. You write to know what you would write if you would write. So it's something really mysterious. It's like being in the dark with your eyes open and you get accustomed to the dark. And at one point you begin to see a little bit in the dark and you can find your way, but you're still in the dark, you don't know. Yes, it is important for me and I can now I see that I have some obsessions and I see that there are themes that come back each time when I write a book, uh, femininity, motherhood, um, social domination, um, racism, integration, all those, those themes. But it's not the beginning of the book. The beginning of the book, it's a character. I have a character that arrives in my head and I can, um, usually it's a woman, I can see her, I can hear her, I know exactly the tone of her voice, I know who she is. And then she became a sort of friend, um, a friend and a ghost, she's here everywhere. And um, at one point I have to write, I have to write her story. And she's the one telling me what I have to write. I have conversation with my character. And I just discovered a few days ago, I was reading an interview of Amos Oz, the Israeli writer, and he was telling about conversation he was having with the main character of his novel, Anna. And he said, I was telling Anna, don't do that. And she told me, yes, I want to do that. And um, I completely understand that. It's um, I live in a sort of a bubble with this character, and this character gives me sort of music and colors, and I know exactly in which atmosphere this character lives. It's something very cinematographic. At one point, I just have my camera, and I'm looking at her, I'm filming her doing her stuff, and I never judge her. And when the book is finished, sometimes they are still here. Adele, the character of the first novel, uh, I see her very often. Very often she comes and she visits me, um, especially when I'm in big towns in the winter, I can I cross her, I see her cross a, a, a street, I see her somewhere having a, a coffee of a, or a glass of wine, and I can recognize her, I know she's here. I think that my characters would love to live in the norm. They, they would love to be, to be good and to be, uh, to be quiet and to obey and to be fulfilled with what they have. I mean, being a bourgeois, being a mother, being a wife, having a nice apartment, they would love that. And uh, they suffer precisely because it's not enough. They want something else. Or it's not that they want something else. They maybe sometimes they want to destroy what they have. They are like children to whom you gave the most beautiful toy and they just want something is to destroy the toy, even if he waited for this toy for his whole life. So 
it's just that I'm very interested in people that are full of contradiction, full of ambiguity. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, we always do things that are good for us. I think that very often we do things that can destroy us, things that are really bad, but we are so attracted to that. And it doesn't mean that we are a bad person, it doesn't mean that we are evil, but there is something really mysterious that it makes us very attracted to that. And the norm, at the same time, the norm is something that protects you, that gives you the feeling that in a way you gain the sort of success, of respectability. But you know also that it's killing you, that you are dying, that who you really are, the individual that you are, with all your passions, your freedoms, your secret, is dying under the, the weight of, of the norm, and that you, you spend a lot of time pretending and smiling and doing as if you were happy. But the truth is, you're bored to be a mother or a father. You're bored when you work. Uh, you would love to go out in the afternoon and get drunk and have sex with someone that you don't know. You don't do it because it's frightening and because you would lose so much. But it doesn't mean that you don't think about it. I think that the more, the more unique you are and the more you look like other people, the more... Uh, intimate you, 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 you are when you write and the more universal you will be. Uh, that's something that I learned from many authors and maybe especially from Albert Camus in, in his carnet. He writes that all the time. If you want to be universal, if you want other people to identify, you have to tell the thing that you have the feeling is the more intimate. The kind of things you know, that you feel and you're, you're convinced that no one has ever feel, felt that. And you're like, no, I'm not going to share that because no one would understand. And it's something really specific to me. And then when you share it, you discover that everyone is feeling the same. And um, yeah, so I think it's very important to try to really explore the, the soul of each character and not to be afraid of telling things that can appear or can seem very yeah very intimate or just that is just a detail something not very significant but the truth is it's in those details that um, lie universality i think that a book can't change the world but i think that readers can change the world i think that a reader is uh, maybe um, someone who is going to have a much more complex vision of the world, someone who will understand some nuance that uh, a non-reader would not. I think it's someone who is maybe more able to accept uh, certain ambiguities. Um, so I think that someone who reads is someone who is more open-minded, someone who is more emancipated, someone also who understands what I was telling before, this universality of emotions and the universality of our conditions, uh, condition as human being. So yes, I think that reading has a role in our society, especially now where it is so difficult to try to express a complex and nuanced and difficult vision of the world and uh, where we are always um, under the pressure of um, provoking a buzz, saying something that it, like a punchline or saying something really short. And um, even our politics, the, if you listen to politics, their language, it's the language of communication. It's a very... It's nothing. If you try to, to find what is behind, there is nothing behind. It's just a concept. It's just a way to seduce people. So I think it's very important to continue to believe in literature because it's continuing to believe in language. And language is the most important tool, tool of human beings. It's the way we express our reason, logos. So I think that if we don't defend the complexity of language, the, our ability to tell the world, to tell stories, what are we if we are not stories?
uh, everything is a story. Even yourself, if you think about yourself, uh, you are a, a story, a story that you are telling to yourself from your, the moment you were born to, to now. So I think that this ability to tell stories is absolutely fundamental and it's very political. We will always need more writers, more story. Uh, we need also a kind of the ability to make a pause, a break. That's also that reading. It's a moment of silence, a moment where you are alone, a moment of intimacy. It's a moment of secret. A lot of things arrive when you read a book, a lot of images in, in your head. And I think that in this world that everything is so fast, where we go from looking at our phone to doing something else and watching a TV show and this and that, this ability to be in a kind of a bubble where no one can come when you are alone, it's something also that we should preserve and it, that is very important. Mm -hmm.